At the beginning of the 15th century, the southern portion of the dark and legendary continent of Africa was unknown until in 1486, Portuguese explorers rounded a cape they first named the Cape of Storms. In 1652, a small group of Dutch colonists established the first European settlement at the southern tip of this land of promise, renamed by the Portuguese from the Cape of Storms to the Cape of Good Hope. To the north lay the dark interior of a vast unknown world, wild and unexplored. Across the limitless expanse of its plains, great herds of animals roamed, and in its forests, the strong held sway. At this time, a mass migration of Bantu tribes from the northern regions of Africa's Great Lakes was slowly spreading southwards. Eventually, they were to meet and clash with the first European pioneers who were taming the rugged country that lay to their north. And so started the opening up of southern Africa, as muscled arms and determined endeavor wrested fertile acres from the wilderness. Our country was not easily won for civilization because added to the natural difficulties, there were clashes and wars between whites, between the whites and the blacks, and between the blacks themselves. Despite this, the young, strong roots of nationhood grew well in the hard-won soil. Finally, in 1902, a lasting peace was in sight. And in 1910, the four territories, the republics of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State, and the colonies of Natal and the Cape, united to become the Union of South Africa. The British and Republican flags gave way to a national symbol in 1928. Now was the time for even greater endeavor as the pioneer's dream of a nation carved out of the wilderness became a hard reality. However, let Hendrik van Traan, a South African maize farmer who farms in the Orange Free State, 800 miles north of Cape Town, tell you something about farming endeavor in our country. In spite of droughts and a fierce climate, we produce about 36 million bags of maize a year now, a vital part of the Union's economy. For instance, maize is the staple diet of South Africa's 9 million Bantu people. In tribal villages and in the cities, maize is eaten as mealy meal, samp and mealy kabu. It also has a huge list of byproducts. It's used in the making of face powder and car polish. It's one of the ingredients of hair tonic and of gunpowder. Down south, for example, in the Karoo, you find wonderful wool farming country. And you know, South Africa is today one of the world's major producers of wool. Here, on the arid felt of the Northern Cape, more than 20 million sheep yield their wool harvest every year. But of course, it has never been easy going for the wool farmer. He has his problems. Terrible droughts, for example, and vermin like the destructive jackal. Now, here's something you'll not see anywhere else. Afrikaner cattle. It's an indigenous breed conditioned to the hard life of the bush felt and the desert like Kalahari. Today, the Afrikaner is our chief source of beef and leather. Most of our farming methods and much of our experience come from the old countries in Europe, but we have adapted them to our own conditions. Take the vineyards down in the Western province, for instance. The French Huguenots who settled in these parts centuries ago brought with them the age-old skills of the winemaker. And today, 
wines and sherries of international standard are produced in the Cape. Of course, this is only one of the ways in which we can trace our heritage back to the mother countries. Most of us farmers, for example, speak Afrikaans, a language developed mainly from 17th century Dutch. We are proud of our traditions and we like to keep them alive as in our songs and dances. These dances have survived from the earliest days in the Cape. And that reminds me, down in the Cape, they have snow and rain in the winter and long, dry summers, a combination that makes fruit farming possible. Pears, apples and peaches thrive in that climate. And much of the fruit harvested is sent overseas, an important source of revenue for the country. Apart from deciduous fruit, we export over six million cases of citrus a year. Let us visit the hot low felt of the Transvaal, where oranges and lemons are grown in vast citrus estates. The Zebedila citrus estate, incidentally, is the largest of its kind in the world. So the fruit varies with the climate, from the cool Cape to the warm, humid areas of the eastern Transvaal and Natal, where the more tropical types are to be found. Perseverance, it has become possible to grow enough sugar cane in Natal to meet our own demands with some left over for export. Now let's see, what about timber? Our country's natural forests consist only of hardwoods and are too small to be of any practical use. But after only 50 years, the difficulties of climate, soil and pests have been overcome to the extent where over one and a half million acres have been put under trees, supplying two-thirds of the country's needs. On the whole, our farming methods have reached a high standard of efficiency today. But it hasn't always been so. Poor soil management and conservation, neglecting crop rotation and overstocking of the land often caused terrible soil erosion in the past. The precious topsoil was carried away by dust storms, summer rains and fast flowing rivers and in places small deserts were created. In the native reserves too the land was wasting away, losing its fertility. But today, the Bantu is also being trained in the proper reclamation and care of the soil. And this isn't the only way in which the Bantu is being instructed and guided in his development. But let someone better qualified than I am tell you about this. The record of the Bantu's advancement in South Africa is one of the most fascinating stories of present day progress in the world. We can learn more about this from a Bantu doctor at the Baragwanath Hospital near Johannesburg Dr. Joseph Marsico. It was not easy to get this patient with a head full of witch doctor stories onto the operating. Oh yes, we still have witch doctors among my people practicing their old rites and superstitions. But then, Western civilization has only been with us a short time. My own grandfather fought against the white pioneers and he's still living today. He was a brave warrior, judging by the stories he tells of the days when my people lived by the spear. Even today, back home in the cross, there is little change in a way of life many thousands of years old. Although the spear is now only for ceremonial use. Most of my people still live the old life in the Bantu reserves. Here, the women do the work. 
carrying the water, tending the crops and bringing up the children. In recent years, one of the most pressing problems has been the housing of the urban Bantu. Millions of men and women streaming into the cities have caused overcrowding. But gradually, with Bantu workers, the slum areas are disappearing and being replaced with model villages and even complete towns. Through the years, a great many of my people have settled permanently in the cities and their children know no other life. The ways of the crawl would be strange to them except for the folklore they have been taught. With these young people, the cycle from the old ways to the new has almost been completed. And with the change has come the need for education, which they get in schools throughout the country. The Bantu are becoming aware of the need for enlightenment if they are to advance with the times. Through careful guidance, they are today achieving a high standard of literacy. Every year sees more Bantu students taking a higher education and qualifying for an increasing number of professions. As teachers, they are passing on their knowledge to their own people, while many hospitals today number Bantu doctors among their staff. In the field of Bantu health, great strides have been made with many new clinics and hospitals. There are nine million Bantu in South Africa today, all one race, but at a hundred stages of development along the road of enlightenment and progress. In addition to the Bantu, there are other non-European groups in South Africa. One of these, the Cape Coloreds, who number over one million, is concentrated mostly in the Cape. Let us hear from a member of Cape Town's coloured community, Abram Peterson, who runs a small printing business. Ah, I was hoping to get this order. It'll be a good run, and in four colours too. The way things are going, we'll have to put in some overtime to get through all the work on hand. You know, more and more people are beginning to realize that we can turn out the job they want and turn it out well. I suppose that's why you find my people in so many varied occupations, whether it's in industry or on the land. But we Cape Coloreds are probably best known as fishermen. Most of us have been brought up on the rugged coastline, this Cape with its sudden violent storms where you find some of the world's finest fishing grounds. Today, South Africa is ranked in the first 10 fishing nations of the world. The demand is increasing all the time too, not only for fresh fish, but for extracting hake liver oil, cooking fats, fish meal, and even paints, soaps, and varnishes. In addition to exporting frozen hake, much of the fish is smoked and sent to Australia and the Central African Territories. And when it comes to rock lobsters, well, we can hardly export enough to the United States. They go over either deep frozen or canned. Now that's a side of the industry that has developed, canned fish. Up the coast in Southwest Africa, for instance, pilchards and mackerel are caught and processed by the million for export to Britain and other parts of the world. Yes, this is an industry that we Cape Coloreds have helped to build. But then we always give of our very best, whether as a fisherman or as a member of a troop in our own annual Coons Carnival in Cape Town. A 
Among the coloured community, but retaining their identity as a distinct group, are the Cape Malays. Joseph Talib will tell us something about them. We Cape Malays are a Muslim people and still practice our ancient religious faith. My people are descended from political exiles who came to South Africa from the East during the 17th century. We have largely preserved our identity in the colored community having transplanted many of the ways of our ancestors to this land. We are good craftsmen, and many of us still practice the old trades of our forefathers, such as coopering. New ways of making things are not always the best, and our handwork is much admired and in demand in South Africa. One of the highlights of the year is when we hold a khalifa. The music and dances of the Khalifa are deep rooted in the traditions of the Cape Malay people. Like the Malays, other people have come from the East to South Africa. At the end of the last century, there was a big influx of Indians. And today we have an Indian population of nearly half a million, mostly concentrated in Natal. Here is an Indian shopkeeper, Salaji Patel of Durban. My shop has grown into quite a big business. Visitors often ask me about Indian religions and customs in South Africa, and I try to answer their questions. We enjoy complete freedom of worship here, whether we're Hindus or Mohammedans or Buddhists. And our temples and mosques are very similar to those out east. We retain and practice a great many of our own customs and arts. <laughs> The coming generation of Indians, together with the young people of other racial groups, are taking their place in the industrial and commercial development of South Africa. Let's hear from Geoffrey LaRue, a fourth-year university student of economics. One thing I have learned is that we, as a nation, are rapidly becoming more independent economically. Growing cities and towns and a rising standard of living are increasing the need for more goods and better services. It's a chain reaction, really, one development creating the need for another. For example, a new plant is erected to manufacture and assemble machinery. So, a new road must be built to serve that plant and the others that will grow round it. Rail links have to be provided and extra rolling stock brought into use. Dams must be constructed to supply water to the factories and the new townships housing their workers. Water will also be needed for the power stations that will go up to distribute electricity, carried by power lines that have to be erected. All this growth adds impetus to existing factories, which calls for extra raw materials and an increase in the number of workers. New wealth is circulating, and so all along the line, activity is speeded up to supply the requirements of an expanding economy. I don't think that anybody who knows his craft can fail to earn his living in South Africa because for every man at work on the production line or in commerce today, another is going to be needed soon to keep pace with development. Today, more and more manufacturers are benefiting from the exhaustive tests conducted on their products in the Bureau of Standards Modern Laboratories in Pretoria.
By adhering to specifications for quality, manufacturers are making an important contribution to the stability of South African industries and ensuring the satisfaction of their customers. As a student of economics, I'm pretty excited about South Africa's industrial future. We have a total population of 14 million people with a rising standard of living. And whether it's in the manufacture of clothing or household utensils or even dynamite for our minds, I believe we haven't even touched on the full potential yet. Along with the steady expansion of commerce and industry has been the almost meteoric rise in mining. Let Peter Westbrook, a geologist attached to a mining house in Johannesburg, tell you about it. Gold mining on the Witwatersrand and in the Orange Free State is the biggest and most efficient industry of its kind in the world, and it is just 70 years old. It was the discovery of a gold-bearing reef on a spot where Johannesburg stands today that sparked off the rapid development of our country. The gold mines are South Africa's greatest asset. Over a hundred thousand people are actively engaged in mining this precious metal. For its extraction, many new skills and techniques have had to be created by us. Because all the way down to 9,000 feet underground, many difficulties are encountered that are unique in world mining. At such great depths, there are problems of temperature, ventilation, and underground rivers. We've perfected what is known as wet mining, which requires special air tools, compressors, and lubricants. Each year brings new advances in mining methods. The well-being of our nation is linked with the productivity of the gold mines. The annual South African production of gold today is about 16 million ounces, valued at nearly 200 million pounds sterling, our largest single earner of foreign currency. Added to this, there is now a new source of income, uranium extracted as a byproduct of gold mining. The Union is one of the biggest producers of uranium in the Western world, and the feasibility of atomic power stations in South Africa is being investigated. But for fuel today, the country relies on her abundant reserves of coal from the Transvaal and Natal, and other mineral deposits in immense quantities exist all over South Africa. There is unlimited iron and manganese to feed the great steel foundries in Pretoria and Thunderbale Park. From the northern Transvaal and the Cape, and from southwest Africa, come the ores to be processed and fashioned into the sinews of our growing nation. Steel for girders and reinforcing rods, for wire and railway lines, and a thousand other uses. For the Union's thousands of miles of telephone and power lines, and for export to other countries, copper is mined in the northern Transvaal, in the land of the prehistoric baobab trees, and also in the arid desert areas of Namaqualand. From mines situated in many parts of the Union comes chrome ore, millions of tons of it every year. In the search for new metals, still more of our hidden wealth is being unearthed. Titanium for jet and rocket aircraft, for example, is now being extracted in ever greater quantities in the Cape and Natal. Since that day in 1867, when a child was found playing with a diamond in a dry riverbed near Kimberley, diamonds have become one of the mainstays of South Africa's wealth. From the desert sands at Alexander Bay on the barren west coast, diamonds that had been deposited through countless ages are today being recovered. The area is intensively patrolled and guarded, but the stories of finding sudden wealth here by just filling a bag with sand are quite untrue. For 26 and a half tons of waste material have to be processed and sorted to yield just one carrot. South Africa's output of these gems is sufficient to supply the major portion of the world's entire demand for precious and industrial diamonds. The Union's diamond industry is still centered in historic Kimberley, but today modern works have replaced the famous old open mine, which is the biggest man-made excavation in the world. 
nearly a mile across and 4,000 feet deep, this fabulous diamond pipe yielded close to 48 million pounds worth of gems. In every field of endeavor, consistent progress in South Africa has been maintained by applying the most modern advances in technology. Only in this way could the developments called for in the country's rapid growth be achieved. New towns and cities are springing out of the felt. Expansion is evident on all sides, spurred by the leadership and knowledge of South Africa's three million Europeans. Theirs was the initiative that won a land for civilization, a land which is essentially still youthful, and in whose quick growth is expressed the vitality of youth. But much remains still to be done. There are frontiers still to conquer, offering to our youth unlimited prospects for idealistic and practical rewards. Even today, great tracts of the country are virgin land. And in our game reserves, the land can still be seen as it was before the coming of man. Perhaps the most exciting thing about the Union is that here in South Africa at the present time is being enacted almost a complete history of man and his efforts to civilize the world he lives in. Here is a contrast in time, the most progressive of man's achievements side by side with the primitive. As the tempo of modern life in South Africa gathers pace and international communications bring all the world's peoples closer together, this youthful country steps into line with the far older lands. That first tentative root that was planted at the foot of the African continent three centuries ago is now, through great human endeavor, bringing forth its rich harvest of mature nationhood.